Well, I'm very excited to have you all here today to discuss this fantastic piece of research that we have completed and uh, we'll be discussing today. Um, this is a piece of research uh, looking at the potential legislative, technical, and societal applications of COVID-19 technologies. It builds on previous work undertaken by the Ada Lovelace Institute to rapidly track, monitor, and understand the development and deployment of these kinds of technologies, vaccine passports, and contact tracing apps. My name is Andrew Straits. I'm an associate director at the Ada Lovelace Institute. For those of us who don't know, those of you who don't know us, we're a nonprofit research and deliberative body based here in London with a mission to ensure that data and AI work for people and society. And it's fair to say that COVID-19 was one of the first global health crises of the algorithmic age, uh, a um, moment where new technologies like contact tracing apps and digital vaccine passports were rapidly developed and deployed in response. These offered promising public health benefits, but during a time of emergency, they also raise questions around efficacy, consents, legitimacy, privacy, surveillance, and proportionality. This report synthesizes the available evidence from a cross-cutting section of 34 countries and presents a set of findings and recommendations across four cutting themes, effectiveness, public legitimacy, inequalities, and governance. We're very excited to uh, um, sort of discuss these topics today with a wonderful group of panelists. But first, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Melvis Melsimler, who's the lead researcher on this project, to walk through some of the findings of this report. Thank you very much, Andrew. Hi, everyone. I am Melis. I'm a visiting senior researcher at the Ada Lovelace Institute. Today, I am going to share the main findings and recommendations of lessons from the App Store, insights and learnings from COVID-19 technologies report with you. As Andrew said, the COVID-19 pandemic is the first global epidemic of the algorithmic age. Hundreds of new technologies and uh, have been de developed in response and data and artificial intelligence have played a key role in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Since 2020, we have been extensively investigating digital contact tracing apps and vaccine passports, which are two of the most widely deployed technologies during the pandemic. We specifically focus on these two technologies for three main reasons. Although some versions of contact tracing apps had previously been deployed in some countries, contact tracing apps and digital vaccine passports were novel technologies in many countries. Two weeks ago, the World Health Organization and European Commission announced their new partnership to establish a global digital health certification by building upon the EU's digital COVID certificate. So these, these two novel technologies will be used in future pandemics. Therefore, it is crucial that we understand whether they have been effective and well-governed in order to increase pandemic preparedness. While governments and regional and international organizations are enthusiastic about reusing these technologies, there are major public concerns around surveillance, equality, and informed consent. These two technologies are different from other types of data-driven technologies built and, and deployed in response to COVID-19. Because digital vaccine passports and contact tracing apps are public-facing technologies, meaning that in order for them to be effective, people have to consent to share their health and other forms of personal data and change their behaviors around them. For example, self-isolate on um, receiving an exposure notification from a contact tracing app. Hence, they test public acceptance of powerful data-driven technologies embedded in everyday life context. And the pandemic has accelerated the digitization of public services. Although these technologies were um, deployed in response to the pandemic, they will have long-term implications on the use of technology in public health and social care provision. Hence, examining these high-stake and high-risk technologies are crucial for building understanding around legislative, um, technical, and social challenges and risks of existing and emerging technologies in public health and social care provision. So in the first two years of the pandemic, we conducted extensive research and published nine reports that identified these challenges and made a wide range of policy and practice recommendations. And our first report was Exit Through the App Store, which explored the technical consideration and societal implications of using technology to transition from lockdown. By early 2022, contact tracing apps and digital vaccine passports had been deployed by majority of countries around the world. 
So we shifted our focus towards investigating these technologies with a particular focus on their effectiveness, public legitimacy, impact on inequalities and governance with the aim of identifying what lessons, if any, we can learn from them. So by convening workshops, conducting desk research and working with consultants, we have gathered evidence from a cross-sectional 34 countries. Our aim was not to provide in-depth national or regional analysis, but rather to take a micro level view and to identify cross-cutting findings and lessons we should learn from a global public health crisis. So I'm going to share these findings and lessons by starting with the theme of effectiveness. So COVID-19 technologies were necessarily rolled out quickly without consideration of what evidence would be needed to demonstrate their effectiveness. There are indications of um, the effectiveness of some technologies, but the limited evidence base makes it um, hard to evaluate their technical efficacy or epidemiological impact at an international level. For example, digital vaccine passports were effective in increasing the vaccine uptake in France, but not so much in other countries, for example, in Romania or Russia. Available evidence indicates that they were not well integrated into broader public health systems and pandemic management strategies, and this reduced their effectiveness. There is again inadequate evidence on these technologies um, impact on public health behaviors. For example, whether users self-isolated after receiving an alert from a contact tracing app. Therefore, the effectiveness of COVID-19 technologies on public health is unclear. And we think lack of evidence indicates one of the most important um, lessons we should learn um, from the pandemic. Our research shows that in order to ensure the, in, the effective use of technology in future pandemics, policymakers should invest in research and evaluation from the start, establish how to measure and monitor effectiveness by working closely with public health experts and communities, and define criteria for effectiveness using a human-centered approach that goes beyond technical efficacy and builds an understanding of people's um, experiences. Public legitimacy was key to ensuring the success of these technologies affecting uptake and um, behavior. So people protested against digital vaccine passports and the restrictive policies they enabled in more than half the countries in our sample. Countries in, in orange color are where these protests took place in our sample countries. Public acceptance of contact tracing apps and digital vaccine passports depended on trust in their effectiveness, as well as trust in governments. Individuals and communities who encounter structural inequalities are less likely to trust government institutions and hence the public health advice they offer. Not surprisingly, these groups were less likely than the general population to use these technologies. The lack of targeted public communications also resulted in poor understanding of the purpose and technical properties of COVID-19 technologies. For example, a qualitative study from the UK demonstrates that people thought that the National Health Service contact tracing app tracked their location in literal sense. However, the app was built on Bluetooth technology, so it did not collect users' location data. These findings show that in order to improve public acceptance, governments and policymakers should build public trust by publishing guidance and enacting clear law about permitted and restricted uses and mechanisms to support rights. But laws and regulations are not enough to convince the public. They should also effectively communicate the purpose of using technology in public crisis, including the technical infrastructure and legislative framework for specific technologies. When it comes to inequalities, not surprisingly, some social groups face barriers to accessing, using, or following the guidelines for contact tracing apps and digital vaccine passports, including unvaccinated people, people structurally excluded from sufficient digital access or skills, and people who could not self-isolate at home due to financial constraints. And we know that targeted public health counter uh, interventions, if deployed in an effective and um, timely manner benefit disadvantaged communities, such as manual contact tracing. 
And experts argue that governments relied on these technologies instead of establishing non-digital health interventions, which as a result led to widening health and other social inequalities. And digital vaccine passports were used for border management in the name of public health, and as a result, amplify global inequalities. Most sample countries um, requested proof of vaccination for unconditional entry before um, at some stage of the pandemic and low income countries found it difficult to meet rigid standards for compliance due to low access to and uptake of vaccines. So these findings show that to avoid entrenching and exacerbating societal inequalities, governments should create mechanisms for monitoring the impact on um, inequalities. They should establish strong social policies and public health services. So they should not see technologies as silver bullet and address the needs of vulnerable groups and offer non-digital solutions where necessary to prevent discrimination and amplification of inequalities. They should also avoid um, creating, they should also avoid creating or reinforcing global inequalities and tensions by harmonizing global, national, and regional regulatory tools and mechanisms. And finally, governance and regulation. Contact trace maps and digital vaccine passports combine health information with social and or surveillance data. Therefore, it is crucial that they are governed by robust legislation, regulation, and oversight mechanisms. Most countries in our sample govern these technologies in line with pre-existing legislative frameworks, which were not always comprehensive. The lack of robust data governance frameworks led to the lack of clarity about who was accountable for misuse or poor performance of COVID-19 technologies. Not surprisingly, there were incidents of data leaks, technical errors, and data being reused for other purposes. For example, contact tracing up data was used in a murder case investigation in Germany and sold to third parties for commercial purposes in the US. And many governments relied on private technology companies to develop and deploy these technologies, demonstrating and reinforcing the industry's influence and the power located in digital infrastructure. So to ensure that individual rights and freedoms are protected, policymakers should establish strong data governance frameworks and ensure regulatory bodies and clear sunset mechanisms are in place. They should also create specific guidelines and laws for ethic by, ethics by design principles. And we think policymakers should also think about growing power imbalance between governments and the technology industry. They should develop the public sector's technical literacy and ability to create technical infrastructure. So these findings and lessons have been identified through our attempt to uncover evidence of existing practices. These technologies have short histories, but they have potential long-term so social implications and bring opportunities as well as challenges. So before finishing my presentation, I would like to share a couple of outstanding questions which should be considered by governments, civil society, and the technology industry to understand these technologies' potential longer-term risks and implications. The first question is how will the infrastructure of COVID-19 technologies and related regulation persist? in future health data and digital identity systems. I have mentioned the Global Digital Health Initiative in the beginning of my presentation, but there are several other important initiatives that we um, identify in the report. And the second question is how have COVID-19 technologies affected public's attitudes towards data-driven technologies in general? There is a lot of research on public attitudes towards COVID-19 technologies. Um, but this body of research was largely undertaken in the first years of the pandemic. So the question of whether and how they have affected public attitudes towards data-driven technologies beyond the pandemic has not had much attention. In this context, we believe that it is crucial to continue to reflect on these technologies' persistent impact on public attitudes towards data-driven systems and artificial intelligence tools. So I will stop here and hand back to Andrew. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Melis. That was a fantastic presentation. Lots of interesting findings for us to get to. And I'm very excited to welcome our panel of, of experts who are going to help us crack into some of these themes. 
Um, first, Dr. Arun P. Jose is a deputy director of the Center for Digital Health, Public Health Foundation of India. Dr. Jose currently leads various digital health initiatives at the Center for Digital Health and is an ardent advocate for equity in healthcare, particularly digital health equity. Dr. Oscar Joseph Strine is an assistant professor at the Department of Governance and Innovation at the University of Groningen, where he is also a member of the Data Research Center. He joined the University of Groningen to collaborate with the first United Nations Special Rapporteur on the right to privacy in a senior researcher position. Nelly Wakaba serves on the board of Health Data Acumen, a data science organization with extensive experience in health research in Africa. She works to train healthcare workers in health research and data science, as well as developing bespoke digital tools that are fit for purpose, responsive to the needs of global South healthcare systems and are sustainable. And finally, Dr. Uh, sorry, Lindsay Moscato is a journalist, producer, writer, and editor. She was previously at Time, covering crypto tech policy, AI, and more, and at MIT Technology Review, where she was editor of their pandemic technology project, which focused on the ways that technology can be used to fight COVID-19, such as exposure notification. Very excited to welcome all of our esteemed guests today. And I think we'll start with just some brief reflections, uh, three to five minutes of each uh, from, from each guest about what the report says, the themes of this report. Lindsay, if it's right, I'd be very interested in hearing your initial thoughts uh, and responses to this. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, so I was an editor at MIT Technology Review during the pandemic. Um, we had a project funded by the Rockefeller Foundation that was headed by Bobby Johnson. And we had reporters Mia Sato and Kat Ferguson there as well. Um, and we were supported by, you know, journalists who were kind of trying to be in the middle of this crisis, spinning up um, pieces that investigated what was happening with COVID technology. Um, it started off with us just kind of tra tracking um, dozens of countries as they rolled out exposure notifications and exposure notification systems. Um, and then it um, developed into tracking vaccine passports and then the implications of those um, technologies going forward. So I think that when we read, you know, reading the report was just a really interesting and fascinating moment to reflect back on that. That was, you know, I've been out of that project for a year by this point. And what's clear is that um, although, you know, we don't know the effectiveness of um, a lot of this technology now, it is sort of baked into whatever is going to happen next. Um, and I think that you know, that was one of the things that just reading this, I found really fascinating. Um, I think that part of uh, the other things that, you know, the other themes that really resonated um, with me were, you know, designing for equity was really a challenge. We talked to a lot of people who said, you know, government technology sort of seems like a success if it hits, if it's, a, if it works for maybe a majority of people or, you know, if it's visibly useful in some certain way, but if it doesn't work for everyone, it is not working. Um, it, missing those edge cases is really, you know, for, for a government technology is not acceptable. Um, we also talked to a lot of people who said, you know, the right people were not in the room maybe when these technologies are being designed or rolled out. There are a lot of ways that um, public health um, officials could have been integrated better. Um, we talked to, for example, Susan Landau, who is a Tufts University professor, um, who is the author of People Count, who was cited in the report. And, you know, she sort of made the point that it's not, you're not designing for an engineer sitting in a room, you're designing for your uncle, your kid's sister, you want people to understand how to use things. And that was sort of a big, um, a big, you know, takeaway for us as journalists as well. Um, the challenges of trust, I think, were, you know, mentioned in the report and really evident in our reporting. Um, we also, you know, someone made the point to us as we were reporting that this these technologies came about at a time when trust was low in technology overall. There was a lot of distrust of social media networks, for example, that were, um, that was beginning to come to the forefront. And um, people were starting to be really cognizant of privacy. So we found that in our reporting as well. Um, and then we also found that the fractured data systems, um, and especially in the US, were a big challenge. Um, health systems were not talking to each other. Um, and so that was making it more difficult for um, public health departments between states to talk to each other. So if you cross the state line, your exposure notification was not working um, necessarily. Um, and then finally, from a journalist perspective, I think we really noted that the power of local media sort of increased during the pandemic because there was a lack of government trust. And so local reporters were sort of filling that gap and trying to jump in and help people in their local area 
um, figure out what to do with COVID tech, um, whether that was getting a vaccine, signing up for a vaccine on, a, on the vaccine platform, or you know, understanding what a vaccine passport was for. Um, there was a vacuum there, and sometimes journalists needed to fill that. Really, really good points. I think, I think uh, again, many themes uh, that we've touched on this report that are also coming through and what you're describing around trust, the way these systems are built, um, and who's involved in those decisions, equity, um, fragmented data, data structures. Oscar, if I may, I'd love to turn to you to hear your initial reflections on the report and if any of those themes ring true or if there's others you, you kind of want to bring into the conversation. Yeah, thank you very much and thanks for the invite. And I really want to start with congratulating the Ada Loveless Institute for working on this report. Um, I, there was a lot of attention for these types of technologies and specifically digital contact tracing apps and you know digital COVID certificates or vaccine passports during the time where we all had to stay at home and where we were all looking at those numbers which were going up and down. But I think it's really important to keep studying this and to keep uh, uh, thinking about what this actually means because there are many things where we still need to make uh, sense of, right? So what actually happened during that time, but also what does it mean for these technologies to go forward and how, in which way do they evolve or change, right? So this is really, really important and really important work. Um, I also think it's important uh, from the perspective, um, you know, also maybe thinking of the title of the session that there is sort of like an app for that and a techno solutionist approach that is really pushed. So there's always like a technology type of uh, um, solution for the problems that we face, even if it's a pandemic, to really uh, reflect on that. Uh, not, I don't want to frame it uh, politically or ideologically. The point of it is just being that there is still this disconnect between uh, setting up those infrastructures often very quickly and then they become very pervasive very quickly and thinking about how they actually land in society and uh, what that means in different types of societies although the technologies are very different they uh, engage differently for instance i remember in the uk when there was uh, one of the spikes during the pandemic that people started to talk about the pandemic. so also like a very clear indication that even if we do have these types of technologies how do we react to that how should we react to that and can we find a better consensus on that and specifically when it comes to this question of what it means for these technologies to work or not work and i'm always struck when looking at these types of projects that there is so little consideration that they are super quickly rolled out there's lots of resources but there is never enough consideration of what does it mean for us that this is efficient that it is working that it is working for a, a broad amount of people and that it does not lead to things like discrimination so that this really really needs more thinking also at this stage and more evaluation to uh, think about what the sustainably um, yeah how can this sustainably work the second point I want to focus on is I really think it's very useful to think of principles of data protection law and how they can inform this discussion. Um, not in a sense that we need to have a very strong ex post type of regulatory approach, but really during the design phase and during the during a phase where we have a public discussion about what this means again for these technologies going forward. So I really think what is uh, very crucial here is, for instance, the purpose limitation principle, so that there is a shared understanding what we use data for, what we use data infrastructures for, and what is legitimate use, what is illegitimate use of this data. And this is often, I know, you know, working at the, at the university, which is uh, quite broad with many different uh, faculties and disciplines, this is often a discussion which is not easy to have with people who come from a very empirical quantitative driven background who are used to lab environments and you have to have long discussions on what it means then for these technologies to actually really work in society right and this is not working the same way although it's supposed to be accurate it's just not. Um, and and so this is really, really important. I want to stress it here again, specifically during the design phase, but also transparency. Uh, is it clear to the people what the data is used for, why it is being used for that accountability, who is responsible at which stage for data collection, where can I go to, but I also want to emphasize individual rights. So for instance, when we're looking at trends and statistics, why is it important? So first of all, how can we make sure that when the data comes to individuals, that it is accurate, right? So that it is not being used to make false assumptions or inferences, but at the same time also, is it really necessary to keep the data of everyone? Uh, can there be selected individuals who have, for instance, a right to delete certain amounts of data, right? When we are only thinking about statistical trends. So all of these needs much more um, deliberation and careful thinking. 
And then uh, the final point, uh, why I think it is very important to have this discussion at this stage is that, as it was mentioned during the presentation, this is also surveillance technology and somehow surveillance technologies inherently have this tendency for function creep. And uh, we see, uh, when, when actually preparing for the discussion today, I um, uh, I read about sunset clauses and I remember that we all had a lot of discussions and also that rightfully, I think, uh, specifically civil society has very heavily been pushing legislators and regulators for introducing sunset clauses into these types of um, frameworks. And they are there, legally speaking, but I mean, we also should now take a critical moment of reflection when we hear that, for instance, the EU digital COVID certificate is now being sort of transformed through a Brussels effect or however we would like to understand the conceptually into like a global framework that is then being taken forward into uh, something else. And I think this is a moment to pause and reflect. So we talked about sunset clauses. We talked about this to, to change formally, uh, to stop at some point. Formally in the European Union, it does within two weeks, right? At the end of June, the underlying regulation ceases to exist. But still, somehow, magically, this uh, thinking and this infrastructure and these types of technologies continue to go forward. And why do we need them? And, uh, uh, and, and what is the purpose for this, right? And I think it's very important here to be aware of, do we really, to, for instance, create another type of passport regime when it comes to international travel, right? Uh, are there any potential discriminatory or human rights threatening side effects to this? Uh, and is this then legitimate? And also who decides? Uh, because uh, even staying in the European Union, this regulatory framework was had a very, very weird place. I don't want to get into the technical details now between being like a harmonized, uh, you know, unified sort of federal style of framework or a member states framework. And it still has this weird place somewhere in between. And there are several players, I'm just mentioning them. So it's the international uh, institutions also now on a global stage with, for instance, for, with, for, with, for instance the WHO, um, then the member states, but also the tech companies, right? And, and private stakeholders who are, who are very important in actually then pushing these standards and without them, they can hardly be implemented. So again, uh, it is very good that this type of research continues. It is very, very important and yeah, let's let's keep discussing this and let's uh, keep being aware of what's going on. Thank you. Oscar, that's three really fantastic uh, big picture themes there around, again, kind of like if you if you build a road, people are going to use it, that sort of notion of the infrastructure we build, data protection, individual rights, and then those uh, points around this, the inherent function group of surveillance tech, um, quite juicy ones that we will crack into with more questions, I'm certain. Um, Arun, I'll hand to you now in case there's any other themes that either want to build on that we've already discussed or, or would like to add into the mix. Uh, thank you, Andrew. And uh, I'll begin by again congratulating Melis and everyone at, um, at a lovely who put, put together this fantastic report. Uh, so COVID was a chaotic time. It, it was a time where everyone was pretty much scrambling. Um, most governments uh, were complete at a complete loss. They didn't exactly know what they were doing. They uh, they had to put new systems in place. I can talk for India. Uh, COVID really put the health system to a test, and it did put the digital health system to a test. Uh, the infrastructure that we had in place, it did put it to a test. But it also did really leapfrog the entire digital health ecosystem. Um, Post COVID. I can say we're post-COVID now, but uh, uh, really the, 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 the journey that India has taken in terms of digital health has been remarkable. The government has invested as a, a lot of uh, resources into the digital health infrastructure in India now. Uh, we're in the midst of uh, putting together the uh, National Digital Health Mission or the Aishman Bharat Digital Mission, as we call it, uh, which is an entire framework onto which all private as well as uh, public agencies would be able to embed their products. So uh, all negativities apart, uh, COVID had a tremendous impact on digital health in India. And whenever I look at this whole time period critically, it's important to also look at, uh, you know, the mindset everyone was in. It was just, uh, uh, everyone was very impulsive. Uh, they had to make decisions quickly. And they were all trying to control a situation that they were not prepared for. Having said that, 
Uh, I think, uh, so in India, we had the contact tracing app, which is the Arugya Setu. There were several concerns with uh, the privacy, although the government uh, did come forward and they responded to those concerns. They made the source code for the uh, application public. Um, and uh, then they also uh, started the COVID application, which was where you could book your vaccination, vaccination doses. Um, so again, formal effectiveness parameters, I, I don't think they were part of it. And it's very difficult to really put a finger on exactly what they did for the COVID pandemic. But uh, I think uh, some of the systems that India deployed at the time have been emulated by several countries. Uh, the COVID application itself is being treated as a digital public good now, and it's been shared with several countries for vaccination uh, bookings and other applications. Uh, again, sunset clauses were not in place, but they uh, uh, tried to spin off the Arugya Setu app, and they uh, now they're utilizing the Arugya Setu for uh, the the digital mission that they're setting on. They're using it for generating uh, personal digital health accounts uh, and things like that. So yes, it could have been done better. There could have been effectiveness parameters put into place. Uh, privacy was definitely a concern, but in India, uh, the digital literacy is very low. And honestly, the awareness about the your rights on your personal data is very low. So uh, there were uh, there were several checkpoints in place. There was a judicial system that came into place. And they uh, made sure that there was equity being maintained. I think it was the COVID app. Uh, initially, everyone was supposed to log in and book your own vaccination doses, which was immediately spotted by the Supreme Court in India as uh, something that would increase disparities. And uh, they made specific changes to the COVID application so as to make it more equitable. Uh, they allowed for a single person to book multiple uh, doses for multiple people in their family, for uh, healthcare workers to go to the uh, uh, to the households and book vaccination doses for them. So there were checks in place. There was uh, there was a certain level of um, you know scrutiny uh, under which these digital health systems uh, worked under. But having said that, I think it's very difficult to uh, really be too critical about the applications that came during COVID because of the, the, the peculiar circumstances that they were under. But again, it provides us with very, very important lessons. And I think this uh, report that has been put together is fantastic. It, it uh, has really uh, uh, sort of pointed out the exact uh, uh, things that I had in mind and that most uh, people in the digital health system in India have in mind about putting effectiveness parameters in place, putting, putting proper governance mechanisms in place, unset clauses in place. So I think uh, the all in all, my comments on the report is, is that it's excellent. Uh, and I really hope that we can take back a lot of lessons from COVID. And I think that's what we're all doing in the post COVID era. I think we're all just uh, learning from what we did and how not to act instinctively or impulsively in the next pandemic, but uh, be prepared. Uh, and have you know proper strategies in place, uh, and there is going to be another pandemic, I think. Uh, so <laughs> we have to be prepared. Thank you so much, Rain. It's a really good point. I mean, I, I think it is important to step back, and acknowledge the incredible um, uh, intensity and need to move very quickly during the pandemic with these technologies. And I, I would hope that, as you say, many of the lessons here are are trying to yeah think through for the, of what what we can learn for the next pandemic. You know what, what what's needed for these tools to succeed and for them to um, uh, sort of achieve maximum efficiency. Also to study their efficacy. I think that's a really good point you raised about about the the lack of clear um, ways of measuring efficacy, uh, which is something we saw a lot throughout this report. Nelly, I'm going to hand to you to, to um, sort of share some initial thoughts and if there's any of these points you want to build on or new ones you'd like to introduce. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much and thanks for having me. I think the lessons are really similar. As I read the report, it's 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 quite, you know, the world is really a global village, um, uh, as they say, because even in our continent, we still had you know those similar things that the report has raised because we had technology being used during the the, the covid pandemic right from drones uh that are giving information um 
robots that were doing screening or even as basic as mobile apps that were being used for contact tracing. So I think pretty much digital health has been recognized as a key enabler um, for health and also for the pandemic response. But the big question here is, digital health um, is only as good as its systems, as the health system in place. And so I think this report really comes out at a pivotal time when we need to reflect, yes, the WHO has lifted uh, COVID as, 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 a, as a pandemic of concern now, but it's a time to step back and ask ourselves, what are the lessons and what do we need to do after this? Because for sure, I'm not a prophet of doom, but we might face another pandemic. So for me, um, I'll double click on two things. One is this report has really stamped the need for investing in the basics. What do I mean? You know, it's not during a pandemic that you start thinking about sunset closes and your digital pr uh, uh, privacy policies. It's before a pandemic. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done with governments, with industry, with players in the sector to really look at their digital health policies, at the regulation, at the frameworks that are put in place. In my continent, um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, about 33 countries only have digital health strategies in place. Very few have the digital health policies, but it's gaining uh, protection policies, but that's gaining momentum. Some regions have even made steps because we are divided into regional blocks. There's even data sharing agreements because as you realized, interoperability is very key. People are crossing borders, right? Health is not contained in your small country. It is a global issue. There is trade that is happening. People are moving. So also health is crossing borders. So all those things need to be invested in and governments are actually making a momentum towards that. I think the, the, the second thing I wanted to say is about people. Digital should just be seen as that, as an enabler for health and not the techno solutionism that we may risk getting into because it solved the problem we needed it to solve during COVID. And so we can relax back. I think it's a, it's a high time that, um, you know, countries really put people at the center. Could we have models of person-centered models of digital health evolving now? You know, what is that basic data that me and my grandmother in the village can carry around, especially from my continent where we have a lot high mobile penetration. What's that basic data that I can carry around because I'm the ultimate owner of my data and be able to exchange it. And then also the non digital health interventions, which I think worked for us as a continent in most countries that is using community health workers, why? Already, there was so much infodemics about the pandemic, so many myths, so many myths, so much mistrust. Then add digital, you know, all the apps and all the things I have to log into, that added salt to the injury. But the fact that there were members of the community who could reach those that don't have phones or can't access technology or didn't even know what logging in means, really was able to hit two birds with one stone. One removing or addressing the infodemics, but two, addressing the inequalities that were caused by the digital divide. So I think these are some of the strategies and, and, and lessons that we have from our side of the continent that I think should be streamlined and could be potential lessons to be borrowed. So I will pause there and hand it over to you, Andrew. No, that, thank you so much. That is a uh, is a really really good point. Um, this actually I think is a nice segue into one of the first questions we have, which is also um, uh, echoing a point Andrew Chen raised in the Q and A function, um, uh, which is around that that challenge of integrating these technologies in public health systems. And it was something that we we saw quite a lot through through the research that, with a few exceptions, it seemed like most countries really struggle to integrate these technologies at scale and pace into their digital health systems. I'd be very curious for the panel if, if um, you have any insight into sort of diagnosing why that was in, in, in different regions and looking ahead, how might that might be better addressed in the future? Um, if it's all right, Lindsay, I'd love to start with you and then um, uh, Oscar and, and Arun and Nelly, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
So we found that in, we focus mostly on the US and in the US, the public health systems are by state. There, a lot of the public health systems that implemented these technologies were state by state. And those um, health departments are often just really underfunded. Um, people were really scrambling. Um, a lot of the themes that have already been raised about just lack of resources and people kind of doing their best in a crisis um, were really hitting public health departments hard and communicating about the pandemic overall was a really big challenge. And so adding on the additional layer of we're making this new software program, we're trying to get people to download an app, like that was often just kind of lower on the priority list. Um, and yeah, I would say that. That's really interesting. I mean, I'm, I I suppose one of the challenges there is um, is thinking about how do you how do you kind of um, create this as a higher priority um, right now within within public health departments. And Oscar, I'm curious if well, sorry, I really can see your hands raised. You, would you want to come in on this question of of uh, of sort of what we can do going forward? Yeah. So um, I think there are uh, there are two uh, kinds of countries countries that already had a good digital health infrastructure in place and countries that didn't have anything digital at all. So um, for India, it was not that we did not have any digital health infrastructure in place, but it was not universal. And uh, the decision to move to a digital infrastructure team post uh, the COVID uh, era uh, or in between the COVID era. So um, I think um, integrating the data was a little easier for us because um, it was possible for us to take all the data that's been collected during COVID and even pre-COVID and build them onto an infrastructure for digital health in India. But I think for other countries, it was a little more challenging because they already had uh, digital health initiatives. I'm not sure if uh, they were well integrated even uh, beyond COVID. I think uh, several countries had digital health initiatives for specific disease domains and for specific um, you know, national health programs that they have within their country. So I think it, the challenge is different in different countries. Uh, for us, it was about how can we take all the growth that we had in digital health during COVID and use that to build a stronger digital health system in India. But I think for the others, it was we already have an existing digital health system. And how do we integrate the new technologies that we are building in for this pandemic? And how do we make sense of all of that? It's a really good point. I mean, I, I almost I think what I'm hearing is sort of thinking about, you know, COVID technology policy. It's really more about digital health policy to begin with. What, what's your digital health approach? I, I think another theme that I'm hearing from, from everyone's remarks is this notion of trust in institutions and sort of how much trust people already have. This was definitely a theme, again, that we found in, in the research, which is this notion that um, uh, public trust uh, in content tracing apps and digital passports often depended in trust in their effectiveness as also as, as trust in the government's institutions to, uh, to safeguard rights and liberties. Uh, again, I'm, I'm very curious to hear how you feel this dynamic played out in uh, in your particular region, um, Oscar, and in, in, in the Netherlands, in Europe. And again, looking forward, if there's things we can learn or steps we can take so that are more specific of how to address that uh, in, in a clear way. Yeah, for me, like from a from a bird's eye perspective, it was um, uh, either you know stick to your guns and try to know what you're doing well, uh, uh, you know, really invest in that, or move fast and break things. And then really go on with new types of technologies and 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 uh, try to implement that as quickly as possible. And I think in the end a little bit of both happened, and it became clear that the integration between the two did not work uh, at all. I think there were some really interesting instances. So, for instance, when France tried to really challenge um, uh, this idea of going with the contact tracing framework, which was embedded in Android and iOS. So where eventually Google and Apple had a very big stake uh, in implementing this because this was the only way to really feasibly on large scale implement this type of uh, digital contact tracing, which then interesting, and, and France was protesting against it because they said, we want to have more ownership of this infrastructure because this is a public health task, right? So we want to be able to really get deep access into those operating systems, which eventually, and that I think is very, um, very interesting to reflect upon was then 
uh, not possible because I, my impression was the companies were really aware uh, aware or like afraid of the reputation of their app stores and then on the one hand really pushed for privacy and security at a very high level right so that they're offering things which are supposed to be safe but they on the other hand stay in control of what's going on so France eventually failed and they also had to go down the this route where with, with a lot of reliance on uh, on these companies and um yeah, I think uh, going forward, what's that, what does this mean? It can lead to two things. So either there is like a shift in terms of like who is setting the policies here and what are the dynamics of doing that, or uh, how can we then um, innovate, uh, make sure that we covered our bases when it comes to public health systems, right? And um, do we want to keep this a public task or to which extent do we want to... Uh, you know, leave this other leave this open to other types of stakeholders, and this is, I think, very very uh, important going forward because uh, now there are changes on the horizon. You know, this uh, has a lot to do with digital identity management, really iterative, uh, slow changes which are very powerful if they play out. When we think of implementing again things like health certificates and so on. And also, uh, what are the ways of uh, of organizing them? Where are the databases stored? Uh, how is the access uh, dependency on platforms, devices, etc.? So I think these are still questions which will go on and which have to be, you know, debates which have to be had going forward. Uh, just, I, I just want to pick up on, on this. This. Uh, it is quite crazy to think back about this in, in a sense that that uh, Google and Apple more or less set public health policy for um, many public health departments through their decision around their app store. And, and you know, as you say, they, I think they had some very clear reasons for doing that in their end. But I just I'm just wondering about that that challenge. You know, we think about digital infrastructure and, and, um, and health responses. It, that is essentially relying on the existing um, infrastructure, which is often dominated by industry players in the tech space, um, health platforms, uh, it might be social media networks. Is there any lessons we can learn here about what from a either digital policy going forward or a digital health policy going forward, that relationship, that dynamic between industry players and, and public health departments might look like going forward? Um, it's a big question. Uh, I suppose, Nelly, I'll give you the chance if you if you want to come in to give this one a stab, but if any others would like to, to answer it, I'd be very curious to your thoughts. Yeah, thanks, Andrew, for throwing me under the bus. But, you know, given on my side of the continent, that's not a major issue. But I think governments must be the custodians of public health. It shouldn't be non-negotiable. They should be able to set the pace. And that's the, the the only way they can really balance out that the, that power is this guard, the guardrails and the policies that need to be put in place. I think that for me is very critical and even a lesson for us um, as 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 we do this because for us it's a question of starting with the basics. Given we have a really strongly paper based system, right? What what lessons can we borrow from this? And what we are seeing is that yes we need to first of all invest in digitalization as a continent but then the other layer is to be cognizant that you know we need to use digital public goods and digital public infrastructure at the outset of course embracing things like hl7 fire standards to be to ensure interoperability and all that uh, but lastly which is very important and may answer your question andrew is promoting homegrown solutions so for us it's more of of, of really being we are a young continent, the world's youngest continent. So we have young people who are doing these innovations. How can we actually, you know, um, invest in those solutions to scale, as opposed to really having a few dominant industry players come to galvanize the market? So in two ways, I see for us, we have the opportunity not to have that happening and to really nip the bud right now. But for the developed world where there's that dominance. I think there's a lot of more tightening that needs to take in place at the policy level to balance out the power. Really good point, Stanley. Yeah, I, I, I think that notion of homegrown solutions is such an important one here. Um, and it actually leads in, I think, quite nicely to the uh, the question of the design of these systems. So I, I, I suppose with that kind of mindset in, in place, if we think about homegrown systems and, and, and what these can look like going forward, um, how might contact tracing and vaccine passport schemes be designed and rolled out differently? What could what could governments have done a bit differently if uh, 
if again we're looking ahead into the potential next pandemic, no doom and gloom here, um, what what might that have looked like? Um, Lindsay, I'd love to hear. Yeah, please. Yeah, so we uh, spoke with a lot of designers throughout this project, and um, I think one thing that came up over and over was the lack of user testing, and I think just a longer runway to kind of think about what people need in their everyday lives, testing with more people, um, figuring out, you know, what someone needs if they're a cashier at a supermarket is really different than what they need if they're able to isolate in an office, um, and just kind of figuring out um, ways that and technology can integrate with people's everyday lives. Um, also, it came up that you know we haven't tested the Bluetooth notification um, systems worked kind of without thinking about okay you're on one side of a wall like Bluetooth works you know in a way that you know if you're in an apartment block that's really different than if you're in a standalone house like all of those questions. I really like that. I think I think user testing is fantastic. Uh, this kind of touches on another theme around inequalities and around uh, how to sort of identify and mitigate those. Oscar, and see your hands raised. Would you want to come on those those questions? Yeah, I actually would like to um, to challenge a bit this notion of uh, of what governments should do because I think one of the striking things, and I think really the European case here is really interesting because there's supposed to be much more integration among the member states of the European Union, is where is the layer of trust, right? So where do you place that? Is the layer of trust your member state? Is it your regional service? Is it the European Union? And what was quite striking for many was that the, 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 the European Union struggled in, especially in the beginning, really a lot against member states of sort of like, you know, taking back control or however you're going to call it. And uh, and eventually that changed, but that was mostly changing because there was uh, a necessity to buy, but for instance, vaccines together, and then you had to boil resources and then you had them, you know, more leverage and so on. So I think, but these are all power played dynamics here, right? And I think if you really want to make progress in this debate, we have to overcome them. I mean, there, it's it's not possible to to completely dismiss them. They will always play a role, but really focus much more on the value based dynamics. So thinking about so which type of principles do I want to have embedded, which type of rights do I want to have embedded, and that's a universal thing to a very large extent. Yeah? Maybe not in its, in its entirety, but I think we should start from thinking from that perspective, especially when it comes to things like. Uh, COVID certificates and international travel and beyond COVID for, for pandemics or uh, regional um, uh, epidemics or whatever. And, and I think there are some tools on the horizon now. So already in law, we have things like data protection impact assessments, which enable these broader discussions, but especially with new technologies emerging, you know, AI and so on, that there will be new methodologies. And I think we should use these types of methodologies and think about them in the, in the health system. Also, how, to, how can we implement them to start a value-based discussion and then see how, it, how we can really make it stick to the different stakeholders and the different communities involved? It's a really good point, Oscar. I, 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 it's, I, I almost wonder if this is it's somewhat in tension with a couple of comments that, that uh, I think have, have come up around this, this notion of creating values-based um, uh, approaches to these technologies, but then the, the challenge of, of whose values and, and, and the sort of Brussels effect, as you were talking about earlier, and, and Nelly, as you were talking about, but sort of homegrown tools. Arun, I could see your hands raised. I'm actually very curious to hear your thoughts on this question. Um, and yeah, just, just curious if, if you wanted to uh, respond to, to Oscar's uh, comment there. You know, uh, I'm just going to make a very quick comment. See, uh, uh, being under surveillance is never going to be comfortable. Uh, you're never going to be, uh, you'll never feel comfortable about being constantly being surveilled and, and you know, uh, anybody having access to where you are at what time and, and you know, who you've come close to or there's, there's always going to be privacy concerns. Um, and no matter, I, I believe that, you know, you need an incredible amount of trust in whoever is implementing a, a contact tracing application or a surveillance system like that, you need to be very, very sure that you know they're not using it for anything else. Uh, I think uh, 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 the point on uh, value, I think it's very important for a person, an individual to understand what value that application has for that person. Uh, and for that measurement or real-time measurement of effectiveness is very important. For example, if an application is able to tell me how many times it's been able to protect me from hotspots or from uh, potentially COVID 
19 positive uh, individuals, that would give me more of an incentive to use this application than anything else. Uh, you know, so then the trust takes a backseat and it's a personal gain for me. And, you know, I understand that using this application is actually useful for me and it's not just for public health or health at large. So I think uh, there are several adjustments that need to be taken and it's always going to be uncomfortable. Uh, I don't think anyone's going to be okay with, you know, being constantly monitored. It's a really interesting idea, almost kind of uh, yeah, showing the efficacy of this. I mean, I, I mean, it is touching, uh, I think, on, on that pandemic problem that happened with the, with the UK system, where I was sort of going a bit overboard <laughs> with the erroneous uh, messages. That's a really good point. I mean, I think that's that's an interesting design point, along with Lindsay, what you're saying about just the, the nature of even talking to people to begin with. Um, I, I'm aware they've got three minutes left, and I just uh, want to thank everybody first off for, again, this wonderful discussion. And I want to give our uh, panelists just a final word if they want to say sort of anything. I suppose the prompt I give is um, if each of you wouldn't mind just sharing what you what your hope is for the, um, goodness forbid, uh, the next pandemic in terms of how digital tools are rolled out. What's one thing that you would say is an absolutely must-have uh, change um, that governments, industry practitioners, public health agencies, et cetera, should be adopting. Uh, Nellie, I'll start with you and we'll kind of work our way backwards. Thank you. Thank you. I think for me, it's three Ps. People, 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 and policies. These are guardrails to protect all of us and not to gag anyone, not even the industry players. And lastly, um, platforms especially in our, in our side of the world, we do need those basic platforms to really not even uh, tackle the pandemic, but to spur further innovation. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much, Nelly. Uh, um, Arun, we'll go to you next. Yes, I think the one lesson that I've learned is that digital health can improve equity and digital health can really work in equity. So we need to be careful on what, uh, you know, what direction digital health takes. And I think the COVID pandemic was an excellent example. The technology that uh, has been picked up for this particular report are excellent examples of how it can increase disparities as well as also help uh, decrease the digital divide. So I think uh, it's all about before the next pandemic, it's ensuring that uh, people are digitally literate. They are, uh, they are aware about their rights about their personal data rights, and uh, there are policies in place to protect everybody, including the, the government and the industry, because even they are uh, liable to lawsuits and things like that. So there should be policies all around. Thanks so much, Arun. Oscar? Yeah, it has a lot to do with the issue that I raised in my last comment. So I hope that uh, there is a way maybe even not for a pandemic, but also for an epidemic where digital tools might be used um, to overcome this responsiveness, you know, just following the best narrative of the moment and really have like a principle-based, value-based type of approach, uh, thinking about how to connect the tools, how to design them well, but also really how to connect them to the communities where they work for. And at the same time, um, keeping it open, right? So not establish new borders, which are um, artificial or which you would have hoped that you already left behind in the past. Um, so I think these are the things that I would like to see in the future. Thanks so much, Oscar. Lindsay, we'll let you have the last word. Yeah, I'll just echo a lot of that and say um, it's important to invest early in digital public health systems um, and build teams that prioritize equity, have the right people in the room and help build trust. Amazing. Thanks so much, everyone. And thank you, especially to all of our guests and panelists for today and to Melis for the wonderful presentation and work in this report. I want to thank you all. The re uh, recording of this presentation will be available on our website very shortly. But for now, we'll see you all later. Have a lovely rest of your afternoon. Take care, everyone. Bye.